Okay, there's plenty of, um, plenty of room. Uh, this is uh, a lot more spacious than what it was in Darwin. I, I do recall people sitting at my feet uh, in Darwin, so uh, you know, that's a lot more spacious than what we had last time. So well done, guys. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Neil Walsh. I head up Civica's housing business across uh, Australia and New Zealand. And on behalf of the conference, uh, Uhuri and Civica, I'd like to welcome you um, to today's Think, Tense, Think Tank session. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, uh, the uh, Wurundjeri... No, that's not it. It's, uh, let me have a look here. Oh, Wurundjeri, yep, uh, nation, and uh, pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so with that, we've got quite an exciting session for you this morning, uh, basically sitting uh, build to rent in Australia, the state of play. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, uh, Luke McIntosh uh, from EY, who's going to kick things off. Over to you, Luke. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's Luke McIntosh. I'm a partner at Ernst & Young. Um, normally I do have the slides in front of me, so I might be looking back a little bit more. Uh, just a bit of background. I started this back in 2017 when we got engaged by uh, a client that is actually in the room today, uh, a government agency, that asked us to look at alternative forms of ha housing and, and could institutional or could build to rent be a, an actual item. Out of that piece of work, we realised pretty early on that, that actually build to rent was about to come. And so we then spent a lot of time, I then spent a lot of time with our colleagues in the US and the UK, uh, touring uh, and really understanding what this asset class was. So I've probably been in for about 2017, but I certainly haven't been the longest. Chris Staff is over here, has been in it just probably longer than me. Uh, Christian Graham from home, uh, Adam Hurst from Mervac, um, who now, uh, he's set up his own business. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, Chris Keyes from Great Star. Probably the, the, the team that really have been around this for the last five years. Uh, I'm going to today just talk to you about the state of the market, where it sits today, and the work that we've been doing in this space, um, and, and the size of the market. All COVID, in the last two years, all COVID has done is pushed out what we're all saying, this massive housing affordability or this housing delivery issue. You can see here that's almost been the perfect storm for build to rent. And, and then while we couldn't predict a pandemic back in 2017, there are a whole lot of other issues that were leading to where we are today that we could see. And we could see that, you know, the compression in investment yields, the amount of weight of money coming to the market, the consistent state, federal and government regulations that have absolutely uh, hampered the, the sector, the lack of investors to supply uh, residential stock. All those factors were starting to grow uh, and really led us to where we are today. And all COVID has done is pushed out this by two years. It pushed out people to the regions, stopped immigration, uh, people started to co-locate um, and people were moving out. So what we're seeing, and these are just some of the headlines that's happened over the last you know, three months. Uh, in the Fin Review yesterday, we saw you know, rents predicting to be 15% growth in Melbourne, um, you know, 1% vacancy rates. Um, you know, Multiplex in 2019 had 35 cranes in the air building residential property in Melbourne CBD. Today, have, today they have about six. Um, you know, we're seeing massive rental growth in, in the Gold Coast. And, and the Gold Coast is a bit like what's going to happen here in Melbourne and Sydney. The Gold Coast has had no stock delivered. Um, over the last five or six years, and while they haven't had immigration, they've had migration. Massive amount of migration. We're going to have immigration. Our border's going to open. We don't need 150,000 people a year. We need 400,000 people a year. EY got jobs out for 1,000 for people. We're about to get our first skilled migrants coming in two years. We're just one company. Uh, and so what we've seen is, is uh, there's a lot of commentary, and we could all have seen it coming, but that commentary is starting to occur. Massive amount of shortage of housing significant rental growth, and we're talking double-digit rental growth. We're probably talking 10 to 12% rental growth. And I know we do a lot of the underwriting, and Chris will be happy to hear about that because we do the underwriting on rents. It's never been harder to predict where rents are going to go over the next two to three years. We've only ever seen double-digit rental growth once back in the 80s. And, I, and believe me, we're, we're about to see it again. We're already seeing it in the Gold Coast, 17% rental growth. We've also seen over the last month, uh, last two months, a number of platforms being, uh, being uh, announced. We've seen Macquarie Bank, we've seen the Alt, Alt, uh, Alt platform, we've seen the Sama Group, <coughs> um, uh, and we've seen, we've, so we're seen, starting to see more capital. We've seen 
Qualtas come out uh, with, with GIC and what's happened with the partner group. So we're starting to see more and more capital come into the space and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. First thing I always do is define this asset class because there's a lot of misconception of what this asset class actually is. Built around as an asset class, it's actually been around in Australia for circa 50 years. We've got uh, student accommodation or PBSA has been around since 2010. What's happened in the PBSA is what's going to happen in, in built to rent. Except in built to rent, we're going to get there a lot faster. It's taken 10 years before we saw over $3 billion in transactions in 2019 in the student accommodation space. We will see that a lot faster in, in institutional built to rent. We've got aged care retirement, we've got social housing, we've got affordable housing, we've got built to sell that was built and retained as built to rent. The asset class I'm talking about is institutional built to rent, an asset class that we have never seen in Australia. So institutional built to rent comprises residential properties that are designed and built as long-term rental accommodation and are predominantly owned and managed and operated by an institutional investor or long -term, as a long-term asset. Revenue is generated through the rental lease of the dwelling as a primary source of income. These assets are typically medium to high-rise apartments and may include smaller component of ground level retail assets. Uh, the offering is tailored to a carefully targeted demographic with optimum services available that appeal to the market. Generally, there are four characteristics. One is opco, propco, or, or owned through a fund structure. So it is an opco, propco, or fund, fund structure. It's owned by institutional capital. Institutional capital own, generally own the propco. Uh, not, they might have some invest in the op, investment in the opco. These are professionally managed assets. This is all about the management. This is not about the development. This is not about getting development profits. The development profits in these assets, I've seen them as low as 3%. For a build to sell, there's generally around 15 to 17%. The development profit sits only around, you know, we underwrite it about 8%. 8 and that's sunk into the prop code. That's not taken off the table. Um, and minimum size is generally about 150. The 44 assets that are currently uh, in Australia at the moment that are under planning under construction or operating, the average size is 395 apartments. Um, I have been in, uh, to a BTR owned by Greystar in Culver City in LA. It was 110 apartments. I wanted to go there because I wanted to see what a 110 BTR asset would was look like. It still had six FTEs on site. It was high end. Average rent was 4,600 US a month. There are, uh, there are a lot of benchmarking data. This is predominantly a numbers game, uh, this asset class. If you understand the numbers, you can understand um, how this, the returns that are generated and how they, these things operate. Essentially, the OPEX sits between 20 and 30 cents in the dollar. In the US, it's around 18 cents. In the UK, it's around 25 cents. In Australia, we're at 30 cents in the dollar, primarily because our FTE costs are higher. Um, we can't claim GST and land tax. Government's doing things about land tax. Again, this is all in the overlay that it's outside the not-for-profit or, or CHP sector, where you can then, and, and Chris will talk about that, uh, where there's added benefits around the taxes. Generally, the FTEs or full-time equivalents, generally it's one FTE per 50 to 75 apartments on site. So on, in 400, it's between six and 10 FTEs. The, the staffing and, uh, and management fees in that 30% budget account for around 12%. So they are, uh, management fees are about five, staffing costs are around six or 7%. Uh, occupancy, we underwrite at 98%, uh, about 2%, 1% bad debt. Uh, we, we, we underwrite at 50, 50 tenants the first month, and then we get to stabilisation at about 30 a month uh, absorption rate. Uh, it never gets to 100%, you never want to get to 100%. Generally, the turnover in these assets, once it gets to fully stabilisation, you're trying to turn over about 30% of the tenants. Uh, you're trying to keep those tenants on average three years. Again, this is general. Uh, every platform is a little bit different, and certainly Chris and what he's doing is a little bit different to, to this. But this is the institutional at market uh, benchmarking. You're trying to turn over those tenants because you're trying to get mark to market annually. This is all about dynamic rental pricing. This is all about the operations. The, the managers of these buildings no longer manage the asset, they manage people. Uh, if you've made three social contacts within that building, you're 95% chance of staying on a full market review. If you've made two social contacts, you're 80% chance of staying on a full market review. This is about keeping those tenants, making them sticky, forming those social contacts and, and mark to market annually on that product once you get to stabilisation. One of the things that managers do is they don't offer, you never offer incentives 
uh, rent freeze, uh, you never off, off um, uh, cashbacks. What you do offer is if you as a tenant bring a friend to the building, I'll give you $500 cash. All of a sudden you've made one social contact, you're more likely to stay on a, on a mark to market rental review. Um, additional income sits at around, you know, if you look at the PBSA sector, additional income is about 3%. We underwrite it depending on the car parking between 5 and 8%. And that 5 and 8% comes from about 30 different sources. So an extra $20 to $50 a week in uh, income from, in, from each, each property can be gained. You need, to get, you need to be able to make sure that additional income can come through, but it's not in the tenant's face. For instance, you don't swipe a card and go into a, an off, an, a meeting room and you have to pay five bucks. That's not the additional income. The amenities in these buildings are generally higher than the built to sell. So the amenities are generally uh, four to seven square metres per apartment. Um, not one square metre per apartment is in the built to sell. Uh, and tenant profile, predominantly this tenant profile is a, is a millennial cohort profile. So those under 35s, that's, that's generally the tenant profile of this asset class. Uh, once they go north of 35, they start to form that family group. They start to want to purchase their homes. Um, it's also that, 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 millennial, that millennial and Gen Z cohort is also 49% of the population, 48% of the population. Uh, it's about 14 million. Uh, rental premiums, I don't like the word premium because there's nothing to compare it against. But the, 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 if you look at the product, there are three operating assets in Australia at the moment. Uh, we're on all three of them, the Mervac one in Sydney, the one in, over in Perth and the, and the, and the Homebush one, and, the, and the one in the Gold Coast. Generally, the, the rent they're getting when compared to the local area is around that 25% higher. Uh, 15 to 25% higher. But again, it's a different product. Back in 2010, when I was at first to underwrite my first PBSA, I walked into an 18 square metre apartment here in Melbourne and I was asked to put $400 a week on it. And I, it blew me away. I said, I, I can't do it. I can just go to the central equity and get a two bedroom for 400. And the manager said to me, who was out of the UK, it's not about this room, Luke, it's about the building. They're paying 400 to get access to uh, like-minded, group of people that are all studying, uh, that, is, that uh, have the same sort of interests, and we also offer all these services around. That's what you're getting into when you're buying this asset class. And sorry, I've got to go through this, because normally it's an hour presentation, I've only got 20 minutes, so <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot to say. Um, where we are today. So since 2017 to today, we are 44 projects. Uh, there are 14, there are actually, this, is, this has already been outdated. There are actually 48 projects, 18 platforms. Um, we're already at around about the 11 billion and we're around about the 20,000 apartments. Now, now oh, we've got a thought leadership on, uh, that we can send out that does uh, state all those projects. But essentially what we are seeing in Australia is an asset class that is coming at speed. In the UK, it didn't start till 2010 and it didn't get institutionalised till 2016. In Australia, it started in 2017, and it got institutionalised from day one. Of the 18 platforms, there's virtually zero Australian capital, um, other than um, probably two platforms, and Chris is one of those platforms. Most of the capital comes from overseas. The Australian institutional capital, like the Australian banks, will, will not be the first to invest in a new asset class. And we saw that with NRAS back in 2010. Um, but and, and same as banks, which is why the projects that are being financed at the moment are being financed from capital um, and debt outside of Australia. So you can see here, and also another telling statistic is most of the assets are in Victoria. The reason why they're in Victoria is because we have the strong fundamentals. We have very, we will have very strong employment growth. The, the Victorian government is spending billions of dollars on infrastructure, all designed to bring jobs. Um, we have um, that, uh, that strong, um, that key worker cohort, that, that millennial cohort. We have uh, the right metrics, the right financial metrics that make this thing work. We have, a f while the planning system needs to be fixed, when you compare it to Sydney, it's unbelievable. So we can get products out in probably two years. There's one, one project I'm working on the Gold Coast, uh, in Sydney that's been five years. And the planning scheme's gone from 600, which is allowed, down to 200, which is not allowed, which, which the council want, and it's made it unviable. 
So you can see here that, that we're, we're growing, we're coming at speed. We're working on another, I reckon, I would say probably another four to 5,000 projects, apartments, sorry, um, across about 10 projects. We're working with another you know, three platforms. And we're also working with an, an, a number of institutional capital that is looking at this asset class. So we're working with institutional capital. We do a lot of the underwriting, the why now, uh, where's the future, the, you know, all that, all that financial information that the institutional capital, the investment analysis, the ICs need to see. So that's essentially what we do. If you look at residential as an asset class in Australia, it's actually a $9.3 trillion asset class. It's gone up about a trillion dollars in the last 12 months. That has zero Australian institutional, it has zero institutional investment in that asset class. Um, the Australian institutional investors essentially missed out on a trillion dollars worth of growth. Their share of a trillion dollars worth of growth over the last 12 months. There are a number of reasons why Australian institutions don't invest, have never invested in this asset class. Uh, when, when NRAS came out in 2010, we were asked by Faxia, the federal government, to do a market sounding with the institutions as to whether they would invest in residential. What came out of that was some, some, some telling data. But essentially the biggest data was, not, the two biggest points was, we will not invest in a new asset class. This is new, no one's talked to us, we don't understand it. Our asset advisors don't like it, we don't know what the performance is. Second one is, well, our unit holders own their own house. You can see there that um, the, our unit holders own their own home. So why do we want to double down into an asset class where our unit holders have their biggest asset? So we would rather go offshore and buy um, build to rent in the US and the UK, which is what we have seen. The biggest change over the last 10 years is that more and more people are renting, less and less are owning. So there is a massive change coming in that, that industry as well. And so the Australian super funds are starting to think, well, we probably do need exposure to this asset class. But before, the, before we do that, we need to know are the numbers working? The initial yields, the growth rates, the turnovers, the, the, the product type, the design. So is that working? But you can see there, 9.3 trillion asset class, there's 10.5 million households in Australia. Of that, three out of every 10 are available for rent. So about 3.3 million households available for rent. And it's that, it's that investor market in Australia that has supported the rental accommodation in Australia. So negative gearing, while a lot of, not, not a lot of people like it, it does provide houses for rent. What we have seen, what we started to see in 2017, was a massive attack on that sector. Fur buyers have gone. Investors are finding it harder and harder to buy investment properties. And essentially what's happened is that that sector has stopped. So it's owner occupiers, downsizers, first home buyers. But we need investors because more and more people are, are wanting to rent and less and less are wanting to buy. So you can see there that you know, Australian listed stocks 2.8 trillion. The commercial real estate sector is, is 1 trillion. We believe um, that the B institutional BTR sector in Australia will get to around about 175,000 apartments, which represents about $120 billion, and we'll get there within 10 years. We'll have probably about 35 platforms. We'll start to see transactions, consolidation. On average, you need about five to 10,000 per platform to make it work. Um, and, um, you know, even at 175,000 um, uh, apartments, we're only talking about 5% of total rental pool. In the US, it's 12%. In the UK, it sits about 2 So we're still only talking a small fraction, but we're talking about a new asset class. And I, don't, I have no doubts we'll get to 12% because we're getting there a lot faster. But um, at the moment, we're just fairly conservative and saying it'll be about a 5% asset class. So you can see there why that millennial and Gen Z, that millennial cohort is the cohort that everyone is trying to target. 33% uh, um, of households, um, so 66% of that asset of that cohort believe they'll never own a home where they want to live. 27% uh, uh, need help from their parents uh, for a deposit. I know I've got, a, I've got a help from my parents from a deposit. I've got three boys. There's no chance in hell I'm going to give them a hand. They can, go into one of my, they can go into one of my rental properties yeah, and, and pay me rent, but, but that number's coming down. 33% um, uh, are currently renting. So there is, there is this, and it's about offering a new experience. The BTR product is like the Uber of, of housing, and it is offering that tenant a better experience. I, rented, I renovated a house and I moved into a rental property. 
uh, for 18 months. I'll never do that again. It was, it was hell. I got taken to court for $14,000 in damage to the house and the judge threw it out. It, it, it was, it, it, there were no damages, just that the tenant, the landlord just, just tried to take us for a ride. They wouldn't fix stuff and it was a, and it was a new house. So it's that change that's coming. It's just managing people, giving them what they want and it's that millennial cohort that, more, that, that generally likes that, that generally is, uh, seeks that type of service, uh, that on-demand service. Um, so we talked about amenities, and amenities is very important. And Chris, I won't still Chris, Chris's discussion points here, because but the type and level of amenities is very important. The amenities is is one of the reasons why you get that that premium um, uh, to the to the built to sell. As I said, it's about four to seven square meters per apartment. It's, it hits seven if you've got outdoor amenities. If it's all indoor amenities, amenities it's mostly four square metres per apartment. Um, and there's about, you know, you can see there, and, and the amenities are very specific to the location. For instance, you don't want to put a, a full gym in there if there's a, is there a, a full gym next door. Um, so you just want to understand where the location is, the demographic for that, that area, the type of product they, they want to see in that location, and, and what they're trying to achieve as to the level of amenities that you do put into that product. Sorry, how much time have I got? A couple more minutes. Couple more minutes. <laughs> this is very important. I put this at the back, unfortunately. These are the returns that, that investors need to see. Generally, we talk about that rental premium between 10 and 20, 25%. We've talked about that. The net initial yield is between three and three quarters and four and a quarter. Uh, that's yield on value. And if you look at a bill to sell, the net yield is about one and a half to two percent. So we're talking, you know, Double that in a build to sell. Now, the, and that purely comes from, at this stage, the lack of development profit in these asset classes. There's virtually zero development profit other than eight, seven to eight percent. Uh, Stabilised IRRs between six and eight. Uh, as a fund manager told me out of the US a couple of years ago, look, these are lean, mean, money-making machines, these are infrastructure assets, these, these are 12-month leases. And I did get asked by a bank uh, the other day to give me the, way to, the whale on 140 apartments. And I said, I can guarantee it's under one year. Um, you don't necessarily put 12, two years, three year leases in place, you can, but it's all one year leases. Um, the development margin between seven, seven and 12 and the OPEX we've talked about 25 to 30%. Um, and I, probably wanted to talk about this the most. We are on the, the, the state government transaction, so we're running the Queensland government's built to rent transaction, which is about 25% of product at a, at a discount to market, about 25%. Queensland government loved NRAS. It's almost like NRAS. Um, the, uh, the New South Wales government were the first to come out of the, the, the block with their Redfern project, which we are the commercial and financial advisor on. Um, there's massive issues with planning on that site, so they pulled it, but they're still committed to, to delivering. And then the Victorian government's the PHRP, which is really a PPP BTR, which is 50% affordable housing. Again, different model. They're all different models. Um, and, and you know, it would be good if all state governments started to deliver the same model, um, but that would put me out of a job. So, so um, you know, we do. But I think all all of them have merits. All all three are great models. Um, you know, uh, ground lease, uh, almost ground lease, but a more PPP style with availability payments, and a, a 15 years. Um, with with um, with uh, uh, rent relief. It's Mervac case study, but we can look. and that's uh, four publications we put out. So if anyone wants any of those publications, we do put out a publication each year on this. Happy to send them through. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Sorry to rush. <laughs> so thanks, Luke. That was uh, some great insights around the institutional build to rent. Uh, model and the importance that, that it has uh, in today's society. Um, now, can we open up the questions? Uh, Luke's got some questions. If there's any questions for Luke, um, happy to take questions. He's not going to escape that quickly from us. Just down the lady down there. We haven't really seen it. I mean, nothing's impossible, absolutely. At the moment, the capital that is chasing this want a certain type of product. Um, it is unproven. 
US, I tell everyone, go to the UK. Go to the UK and look what's happened. Since 2010, it came out of a housing crisis, and it's where, where they are today, about 120,000, 40,000 in construction, operate, uh, 30,000 uh, operating, and, and 40,000 planning. We're more like the uh, UK, but we're going to get there faster. US has evolved over 50 years. So, you know, noth nothing's impossible. Put a business plan together, and I'll help you find the capital. <laughs> okay, we, I think we had a question over here somewhere. Oh, this lady just down in the front. Hi, I'm Helen. I'm a lived experience person. I wanted to know what lived experience I have got in design of your um, spaces. And also, there's a group of people that can't get housed because of um, complex health needs. I mean, the immune systems can be compromised if they go into public spaces. So I'm just wondering how this is going to fit in because that model only fits people that have got a certain amount of income to afford that. Yeah, and there are, you know, 27% of the population millennials, 21% uh, of Gen Zs, so about 14 million people. We're only talking about 300,000 people probably in this asset class. So, uh, again, a fraction of a fraction, a small amount. Um, I'm not an architect. I don't tell architects what to do. Uh, I just run the numbers. Um, you know, there, there are other models out there. There are certainly other models, NDIS and SDA housing. Um, but um, unfortunately, I can't comment on that. I always try and optimise. I always look at the financial results and try and give advice around optimisation to get the best financial results. Other people come over the top of me uh, and tell me not to do that. That's fine. <laughs> Any other questions for Luke? It has to. It absolutely has to. We need Australian super funds in this asset class. Uh, I believe we will see that. Uh, I believe we'll see that once, it, once the asset advisors understand the asset class. We do a massive amount of number around benchmarking. Because we're on about 70% of the projects, we get to see everything. And we're on the only live project, so we're seeing all the numbers as they fall out. It's those numbers that the asset advisors need to see to give their Australian super funds the advice. So we, we benchmark everything. All the data we benchmark. Um, OPEX, very important. Uh, rental growth by product type. What, the product, what is a product type? At the moment, it's 75% studios and ones, 25% twos, 5% threes. The three bedrooms are not on the top. The three bedrooms are on the same level as the amenities. There's about a 20% price gap between the three bedrooms and the studios and ones. The studios and ones provide higher yield. And actually, you're getting stronger growth at the moment out of the studios and ones than you are out of the two bedrooms, two bathrooms. Um, so, so yeah, so we benchmark a lot of that, and the purpose of that is when the transactions do occur, and we think they'll start to occur in, in the next three to five years, um, we'll be at the forefront of those transactions. At the moment, it's all about capital raising, but when the transactions start to occur, then I think we'll see the Australian super funds start to look at this asset class. And not that they already ha aren't, they're, certain, they're looking at certain vehicles already. Do we have any other questions? Oh, gentlemen. I think, well, co-living is an issue, obviously, because of what's happened. We've seen Hamlet go bust. Um, you know, studios, we are seeing strong growth out of, the, out of the annual rents, out of studios and one bedders. So more people are going for that product. Um, you know, less and less are going for the two, two and twos. And the families, and, and, and this is a big misconception. I was calling it, um, you know, I was, what was I, I was calling it built to rent. And this fund manager from the US said, Luke, stop calling it built to rent. It's multifamily housing. I said, but there's no families in these assets. Families are less than 5%. Where's the families? The family's the cohort. You get the cohort right. Doesn't matter. You get the cohort right. And then, and so, but the families do take about 5% of the product. Um, and, and they want to be on the same level as the amenities for their kids, things like that. Uh, one more question and then we'll have to sh shut it down. Uh, if you look at the majority of the product, it's all within 10 k's of CBD. But everyone has a different thesis. Chris's thesis is different to Greystar's thesis, is different to Mervac's thesis, different to Hyans, different to Macquarie Banks, Hines. Everyone has a different thesis. Everyone has a different cohort. Everyone has a different target. Uh, and so that's what that's what a lot of them are trying to do. Greystar, 
I don't know when you're talking to Chris, whether it was when Macquarie Bank were the investors or when um, Ivanhoe Cambridge or um, the, his other investors came in. But his, his thesis has widened from the early days with Macquarie, it's very specific. Another thing too is the capital wanted the sure things. So they wanted to make sure that you can convert this into a build to sell if it didn't work. And Greystar City Road is a classic example of that. Sorry, Home City Road is a good example of that. Um, so very, they needed very good locations, lay down was there. Uh, they needed good strong rents so they can underwrite under, under the, the thesis to the investment committee. So that was more probably Chris Key's thinking. Now he's probably expanded, we audit Chris, so we can't, I don't really get to do much other than see his numbers. Um, Perfect, well, Excellent. thanks again, Luke. Um, and uh, can we put our hands together for Luke, please? I'd like to now introduce our next uh, presenter, Chris Daff from Assemble, who's gonna be talking to us about the transformation housing solutions, building strong, connected, and resilient communities. Over to you, thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. So I'm just gonna have a bit of a chat about the way that we think about build to rent and the multifamily asset class and I guess the things that we've looked at, so I've spent a lot of time in the US, uh, continental Europe and the UK, looking at how different operators that are focused on the sort of lower income segments of the housing market, how they leverage things like um, tax concessions, concessional finance, um, you know, global fixed income investors desire to participate more in sustainable development gold link bonds and some of these themes. So, so at Assemble we've got a team of about 45 people that have got varying skills. So um, some are in sort of community and asset management, some in development and delivery. Uh, we've got an investment banking team effectively that help manage our sort of capital raising. So managing relationships with our debt and equity partners. Um, assembles 25% owned by Australian Super, so um, so Australian Super um, allocated half a billion dollars of equity to one of our development models, which is a, a rent with the option to buy model. So that's sort of more a middle income product. So I won't focus on that so much, and it's sort of like a bit of a build to rent hybrid too. So we sort of own it in one line for five years, but then we start to title it and get people into home ownership. So um, I'll talk more about our sort of pure play build to rent, which are assets that are institutionally owned in perpetuity and owned in one line, never strata titled, so today. Um, and I'll talk about the sort of part of the housing continuum that we're really focused on as well. So, so this slide, and, and Luke had a similar slide on his second last slide. Um, so our sort of two key development models, the right hand side is our build trend to own model, which Australian Super is very focused on. And one of the reasons that we were able to get one of the industry funds off the bench into um, direct housing investment was that, um, for Australians, so they've got two and a half million members, average member salary $66,000 a year. These people find housing very hard and they also know that, uh, as Luke mentioned, as to why Unisuper and some of the higher income uh, industry funds aren't that interested because their people already own homes. Uh, home ownership is an important part of the retirement income story for, for Australians So, um, and superannuation can only do so much. So Aussie Super was keen for us to develop that model and find ways to get sort of more low and middle income Australians into ownership. And we've got about uh, 500 people signed up and about 20,000 people on a database that are interested in participating in that model. The model I'll focus on today is our um, joint venture build to rent model, which is a partnership with uh, Housing Choices Australia. So, um, and there's a, there's a few things that the community housing sector brings to our projects. Um, one's expertise, so one's expertise in, in dealing with people that might otherwise be in social or public housing. So, you know, Housing Choice Australia's got a network of 178 sort of service providers that they can connect those tenants into to the extent they need a bit of help with some, some things in their lives. Um, one of the other things is um, incorporation of not-for-profits directly into the commerce of our transaction qualifies us for a whole bunch of tax concessions. So, and we're not trying to get tax concessions to sort of juice returns, we're trying to get tax concessions, use concessional finance and the things so that we can deliver lower rents. So, and sort of try and still try and deliver the same returns that investors that want to charge premium to market rent because the buildings are full of a whole bunch of shiny things um, are expecting. So, um, and we're about to, in the next six weeks, we'll announce a partnership with uh, another industry fund who's focused on social and affordable build to rent um, as a solver for a bunch of reasons. Um, that's part of their impact portfolio. Um, another sort of Commonwealth backed investor will be in that as well. Um, so, and those, so they're the two equity holders, and then we've got you know, a bunch of different people that we talk to about um, senior financing. So, a couple of the commercial banks are interested in those projects with us, um, doing some work on them. And that's really, again, that desire for 
sort of impact linked bonds, so you know, sustainable bonds, sort of social bonds and the like, and there's a sort of flight of capital globally into um, those impact pieces and organisations and investors trying to realign, you know, their sort of ESG type aspirations. Um, so, and then also we talk to NIFIC, so National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, so they're, not, they're another option and having the community housing sector is obviously critical or um, fundamental to getting them into the schemes and then other things like social housing growth fund in Victoria. So there's, you know, some of those um, state and Commonwealth backed agencies and, and funds are, are really quite interesting to deal with and quite, you know, sort of dynamic in some ways in the way that they're happy to look at supporting new models um, in delivering low income housing. So the sort of area that we're focused on in the continuum, um, so you, we think public capital does, and it's not perfect, nothing's perfect, but a pretty good job, you know, at the really sort of pointy end of the, the housing market, you know, so priority one sort of clients and, you know, homelessness, transitional housing, and I know it's not perfect, there's a lot of issues, but they do do a pretty good job putting a lot of roofs over, you know, in this state, a lot of Victorians' heads. And then the private market's done pretty well historically. It's about to fail. You know, so rents are going through the roof. There's no doubt about that. There's been a systemic undersupply, structural undersupply of housing. So Melbourne off the plan completions, which has been the traditional model for delivering private rental properties to people on sort of upper low through middle incomes. Supply's been off 40% for six years, and it's even worse again this year. So, and as Luke said, rightly, you know, it's not a complicated thesis. You know, we're about to have, you know, pretty extreme population growth over the next three to five years, structural undersupply of housing, rents are going through the roof. We've seen it in the US. So, and two things will drive it. One's structural undersupply of housing. So this is, you know, it's a catastrophe really, um, without being too dramatic about it. <laughs> um, so we've got a structural undersupply, high immigration, high inflation, high wage growth. So, and that's probably fine if you work at EY, you know, and you're getting 10% you know, not to single out EY, 20% year on year pay rise is fine, housing's going up at 10% per year for three years, no big deal. You know, if you're on CRA, which is going up at 225, 2.25 or something a year, then you're, you're going to be pretty cooked and under a lot of pressure. So, so that's, I guess, the, the area and the sort of cohort that we're focused on. So we've got this gap between private market housing or private capital financed housing, which is off the plan apartments and that sort of thing the public housing, and we're sort of trying to operate in this middle, missing middle. And they're probably mostly low income people, are probably the working poor, maybe a couple of days a week employment, um, get some Commonwealth benefits, et cetera. So, and exist in private rental, but do so under, you know, a fair bit of stress. So, um, so that's the sort of cohort that we're particularly focused on. So as one component, and then the social housing, you know, is something where, you know, Roberta and James and the team at HCA um, source, help us source and manage those tenants. Um, I've spoken about this, this is a sort of rental void slide, so that's, that's our sort of focus area, so um, not trying to get you know, right into sort of public housing, but just trying to fill this sort of missing middle. Um, our partnership with HCA is a very important relationship to us. It's also a very important relationship to our equity and debt financiers, so having the community housing sector in there to help um, interface with some tenants that may have more complex needs, you know. But to be honest, I'm less worried about our sort of social housing tenants. I'm more worried about the sort of 25 year old that works from KPMG and is out partying, partying until 2 a.m. every Saturday night being more disruptive than our sort of lower income tenants. So, um, and I don't need to tell this audience about HCA. We're obviously in other forums, you know, people are probably less up the curve on the good work the community housing sector does. You know, really the original build to rent developers, right, in Australia. So I've got the biggest portfolio of wholly owned rental properties. Um, we incorporate SDA and some other things. SDA doesn't move our models around a little bit because most of our projects are sort of 200 to 500 dwellings. So, so we don't do it to sort of try and increase return. But um, given HCA started out as a disability housing business, that is something they've got some expertise in and um, makes up a part of our sort of housing stratigraphy. Um, and then I guess a few of our projects. So uh, this project's in St George's Road, Preston, which is um, actually adjacent to a project the Victorian government's got in Oakover Road, which is Public Housing Renewal Program Package 2 is one of those sites. So we've got about 430 apartments here, a supermarket. Um, so there'll be 86 social housing dwellings that'll be managed by Housing Choices Australia. Um, housing Choices Australia will be an equity co-investor in that project. 
Um, and then of the balance 80%, there's about 30 to 35% that are at varying levels of discount to market, between sort of 10 and 20% discount to market, and then the balance at market. So, and some of those, so on average, our schemes tend to be about sort of 7 to 8% below market rent in the location. So we, we sort of share that discounting around. So some people aren't getting any discount because they don't need it, and some people are sort of getting a lot of discount because they, um, they, they need those rents. So, um, and the way that we're able to do that is to access your yeah, lower cost senior financing. Um, our equity investors, um, you know, I think are still delivering similar returns to what we might see on some of the other projects that Luke was talking about. Um, but we also qualify for deeper land tax concessions, um, uh, GST exemptions, and a whole bunch of other things that help lower the cost base operationally and in terms of capex up front, you know, how much it costs us to build an asset. Um, and then we leverage those savings into delivering um, lower rents. Um, another project, this is a partnership with the Uniting Church of Australia. So this is about to go to the Victorian government architect and um, dwelt for approval. Um, so this is a lease, a ground lease partnership with the Uniting Church. Um, we pay their market ground rent for the, for the, um, for the duration for the 60 years. Um, it's about 214 dwellings. Um, and then we've got another project in East Boundary Road, which the first stage is about 450 apartments. And we've got other projects in Clayton, another property in Preston, two in Brunswick, Wool and Gabba in Queensland, East Perth. So we've got a bunch of different projects around the place. We've got a national portfolio of about five and a half thousand dwellings now. Um, we've got about $900 million worth of construction starting this year, which is, that's all in Melbourne. Um, and then potentially, depending on what happens with the Queensland government process, starting another project in Wollongabba um, later this year as well. So, so that's sort of um, our focus. And I think we're, I think a bit unique in Australia. We haven't done anything new. Like there's no some sort of clever sort of cake that we baked here. All we really tried to do was replicate um, the North American or the United States low income housing investment ecosystem where you've got sort of LIHTC and MITEC credits. So the development industry sort of leverages these sort of taxation credits or tax benefits. We've tried to do that with GST and land tax and other taxes, um, coupled with, you know, concessional finance. So in the US, it's Fed-backed um, capital getting pushed out of Freddie and Fannie into low-income housing. And, you know, we're talking to Treasury Corp of Victoria or NIFIC or other organisations, and even now the commercial banks, you know, are probably getting more down into the pointy end of that concessional financing. So, um, yeah, so that's our focus and um, we see like institutionally owned housing assets um, as they are in other locations, um, you know, in other geographies internationally being a real solver for low income housing. So um, one of the good things, and Luke mentioned it earlier as well, it is, low income housing is very infrastructure like. So, so if you're sort of looking at, you know, how do you analyse, you know, an infrastructure like investment thesis and you're saying, well, how critical um, is that thing that you're investing into someone's you know, ongoing well-being? How defensive is that asset class? So, and you know, if you sort of analyse, you know, quite simply, say Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and saying putting a roof over someone's head is going to be just as important in 30 or 40 or 50 years' time as it is today. So, and the reality is, you know, if you live, you know, say you go to a two-bedroom apartment in Elwood, you know. In, Bayside Melbourne and have a look at what that is and it was built 70 years ago. It's basically the same thing that gets built today. You know, it's two bedrooms, wardrobes, bathroom, kitchen, living area, balcony, right? So, so the things don't actually change too much over time. So our clients who are infrastructure-like investors and are looking for highly predictable cash flows over time um, are very focused on housing, being able to deliver, deliver that for them. So, and as you know, the housing market sort of spiralled out of control, um, you know, other industry fund clients um, you know, become more and more focused on stable, long-term rental housing being a sort of solver for their members. So, because they, a few of them, you know, sort of a few of the funds in particular have realised that ownership's really just going to be unattainable for their cohort. So, if they can provide tenure security, you know, and get rid of a bit of housing anxiety for their members and say, we'll give you a 5, 10, 15 year index lease, then um, that's another way that they can sort of solve for, you know, someone's... Um, you know, sort of sense of housing security, I guess. So, yeah, so that's about, about it from us, and unless there's a few questions. Perfect, thanks, Chris. Um, really pleasing to see um, some really innovative projects going across the country, so well done. Um, do we have any questions for Chris? This lady right down the front.
So, yeah, so in terms of lease indexing, look, so our base case on market rentals at sort of 3% year on year, um, and for social housing, we're about 20% below that. So trying to match it with what CRA and some of the other Commonwealth benefits that people rely on um, is going to be indexed at. So, so making sure our rent's not moving away from whatever support they're getting from government or other agencies. Yeah. Yeah, so our clients want to provide up to decade long leases. So, um, and so in the Australian super stuff, it's a bit different, but you know, it's rent with an option to buy, but they're five year leases. Um, so um, that's got fixed two and a half percent year on year indexing in those. Um, um, and then with the stuff that we're about to announce with a couple of other clients, um, there's, you know, if you're at market, then the minimum indexing's sort of 3% year on year. Um, and then, which is going to be well, you know, well below market. So, you know, all Luke's other clients would sort of roll their eyes at that. But our clients, as long as we can control costs, so the one, one thing that we'll be nervous about at the moment is inflation in the operational cost of our assets through wages or cleaning, third-party contracts or whatever else. So as long as we've been able to sort of lock away some of those cost-based items over time, then we'll be adopting yeah, an approach to indexing like that. So And the, the view is, so, you know, if you've got a reset, so say you give someone five years at fixed 3%, at some point you make it back, at some point they move out, you know, and you might go in there and touch up the apartment or whatever and you reset to market and then you sort of go again from there. So it's not like you're missing out on market value for all time, you're just providing more stability for someone, you know, over the duration of that, that sort of medium term lease. Yeah. <laughs> Finish it off, yeah. Yeah, I took those slides out. Maybe I should have left them in. So, um, so we've got um, got a team that works on how we're thinking about ESG. We published our first impact report um, in June 2021. So, um, and given the nature of our, we were pretty lucky because what the business did and what we were focused on, we were already sort of thinking pretty heavily about our sort of social and environmental impact. Um, the big challenge for us now is decarbonisation. So, what's our net zero action plan look like? Um, you know, what, I guess, operational carbon's quite easy. So we're net zero operational as a business. All our assets will be net zero operational carbon. Embodied carbon when you're building new housing assets is the, is the more difficult thing to deal with. So, so we've got a team that's working on what's our net zero action plan look like in terms of reduction in embodied carbon in our new housing assets. Um, and we've got a targeting a 50% reduction over through the period of to do it through to 2030. And that's so we're going to have to do that in a linear, linear way. So there's going to be some things that we can do relatively easily for relatively low cost to reduce embodied carbon in our assets. And then there's going to be some bigger moves that you know we sort of have to introduce over time. But it's going to be pretty challenging, but we're pretty confident that we'll be able to you know, deliver. And our clients, you know, that's pretty base level expectation for them, to be honest. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nick from Power Housing. Um, well, I think the, definitely the desire from the capital providers is, is enormous. Um, and I think there's a few things that have obviously gone its way. We've seen yield compression across most real asset classes, particularly over the last four or five years. And our investors are looking at it now and saying, well, I can buy an industrial shed in Western Sydney for a 3.5% yield or 
you know, and there's a thesis there around rent growth, obviously, you know, where I can be in housing and because I sort of talk to our clients about it and say, so we've just gone and put one RB into these industrial sheds. I said, well, what's, you know, how useful are they going to be in 15 years time when everything's getting driven around by drones or whatever the hell's happening? You know, it's going to get disrupted at some point compared to housing. So I think they are recognising in a deeper way the uh, defensive nature of housing as a as an asset. So um, you know, how big can it get? You know, anyone's guess. Everyone's sort of got their own sort of thesis on on how big it can get. I know, um, you know, we're talking to the industry fund movement around, you know, investment towards 40 to 50 B, you know, over 12 to 15 years. So, but ultimately it's expensive. So when you actually divide it back, you know, it's, 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 it's a, don't get me wrong, it's a vast amount of money, but, um, you know, so um, you know, we've got a plan to do 14,000 dwellings with Assemble over, um, um, over 12 years, um, we're about to establish an investment management platform called Super Housing Partnerships to deploy more of our clients' money into projects that Power Housing's developing directly or HCA or Mervac's developing in joint venture with Power Housing or whatever it is. So to be able to, so Assemble doesn't always have to be the developer and operator of the asset. So there's too much concentration risk for our clients, you know, deploying just through us and reality is that'd be difficult for us. So. So we think with the establishment of this new investment management platform that can invest across a bunch of projects as long as the community housing sector is involved, um, then that's you know infinitely more scalable than us just trying to do it all ourselves. Yeah. More question right at the front here. Uh, no, we're not still involved. We've, we've we. We say to people, we're happy to be involved if they want us to be. Um, I guess what we do is every six months we have like an during the five year lease we have like an owners corporation type meeting, and what we're trying to do is upskill the residents to basically be able to manage the asset themselves. So it's expensive to have us there manage it with on site staff and everything else. So we want it to operate more like a housing co op type model where the residents are doing a whole bunch of things themselves. So um, and things like car parking which is a pooled arrangement so um, that's never strata titled so whatever revenue the, the future you know the owners can generate from that offsets their cost of operating the asset cleaning common area lighting those type of things so um, so we've gone to trying to find a way to um, take out costs from the operation of the asset sort of once we leave um, when we own it you know our institutional clients you know have got certain aspirations and expectations about the way in which their assets are managed but um, we really want to sort of hand that over. It can either operate as a traditional owners corporation, but um, what we're trying to do is obviously get the, the community to do more direct management of their asset themselves. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, right up the back. Yeah, no, it's, it's, look, it's, I don't want to go back to the money all the time. It's more cost effective for us to build every apartment the same, um, allow, whether you're paying 200 bucks a week rent or 500 bucks a week rent, um, then you get full access to our app, our technology, full access to the on-site staff, all the amenities, common areas. So, so it's, it's obviously 10 year end operationally blind. So, um, you know, we think that's, you know, obviously important for a bunch of reasons, you know, including development of social capital and, and the like over time. So, um, so there's no yeah, differentiation in terms of the actual apartment or the home itself or the way in which those residents can interact with services and, um, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Donald? Um, I actually visited um, the Cold City place uh, <laughs> and uh, one thing was interesting, I said, well, how long can you get a, a lease for? And they said, because we are offer security in Kenya because of what we are, mm. no tenant wants more than one year lease. Yeah. They even sent the tenant to the safety up. Right, give me the shortest lease possible so I've got freedom. That's it's an interesting point and I've heard Adam Hurst from when he was at Mervat make that point in himself where the asset class almost solves for the housing security because it's an institutionally owned asset that you know has been built to be rented out in basically in perpetuity you know that as long as you're happy to keep paying the rent 
you know, then you're free to stay there. Whereas obviously people say more in the Australian context have been exposed to that sort of year on year cycle where, you know, the mum and dad invested it, owns their property, might sell it to an owner occupier or kick you out because the kids are ready to go to uni like Luke's sons and he wants to want to stick them in there. So, yeah, so, um, but in, in a certain way, I think it, it does solve for that tenure security point. Um, it doesn't always solve though, I guess, for market reviews and those type of things, which could make cost of housing escalate potentially build beyond a household's needs or means over time, yeah. Okay, we've still got a bit of time left, so any more questions for Chris? Yeah, um, we probably look at it more from our market rental component housing and saying, you know, where are the locations or postcodes that might outperform metropolitan average over time. So we do sort of focus on more middle ring emerging areas. So whereas you say, and I often talk about supply, so you know our view is, and I know it's not exactly this, but like markets like Dockland, CBD, South Bank have basically got infinite supply. You know, so there's 30, 40, 50 years of supply there. So in a high supply market, you'll probably see rents trend more with just metropolitan Melbourne averages. So um, whereas markets where in like say Preston, um, Brunswick, Clayton, Bentley that have got you know less supply side, um, less supply, um, we do expect to see some outperformance in our market rents in those locations over time. So you know Preston is a classic example. You know it's sort of like, well let's look at Brunswick. We've got a couple of projects in Brunswick. You know, Brunswick, you know, in 2022 is just full of a bunch of sort of rich people who pretend to be poor. So, you know, some of the sort of people that made it what it was have sort of been pushed out to Coburg or, you know, so, you know, and Preston's like that as well. Like, you know, so, and we see a lot, we look at gentrification, so Gertrude Contemporaries in Preston, you know, the sort of cool barbers and sort of, you know, the old mechanics workshops that now house artists and brew brewers and whatever else is... Um, the sort of areas that we're probably interested in where we might see some outperformance in our market rental over time. Uh, so, in the ha in the ha the commercial lease or the residential lease? In residential. Yeah. So the res what we'll do in the res so we give someone five years, we'll say, well, this is whatever the starting rent is, and that'll be whatever it is, and then there'll be fixed escalation over time. So they'll have certainty on how much their sort of cost of housing is going to be over sort of five or ten years, and. You know, it's, it's, and it's commitment really one way too. They're not obliged to stay for five or 10 years. You know, they can leave after 12 months, 24, 36. So, yeah. I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, actually we'll have two more. That's okay. Yeah, look, there's um, most of our stuff's developed under long term ground leases, so you can never really sell it. So, but there is the risk that the current asset owners, like we don't own the assets, we just manage the assets on behalf of asset owners like Australian Super, etc. So, um, that they sell to another party. Like, and there's been probably more the um, not so much the European. Um, institutional investors, but some more Asian, some of the North American funds that we've spoken to over the years are more like saying, you know, literally like, how long do I have to leave these social housing tenants in here before I can strip all the tax concessions out and then kick them out and put in marble bench tops and jack the rents up, you know, and then sell them. So they're not value aligned with us, so we didn't partner with them. So we've got more um, alignment with, say, the industry fund movement, you know, in Australia. But look, that's always a risk because the reality are, is they are assets and, you know, if, you know, the industry funds want to sell them or move them on, then there is the potential that those low income tenants get dislocated over time. Sometimes it gets more hardwired into our planning agreements and the like. So where we've got sort of certain agreements that run with the land that say there's a certain proportion of housing that needs to be set at certain rents for a certain duration. Um, but it is hard, it's, it's, it's very difficult to sort of lock that in in a sort of perpetual way. Yeah. Did you have a question down there? No? Okay. 
Okay, well, we'll wrap things up then. Um, if we can put our hands together again for Chris has done a fantastic job. Thanks, Thanks again, Chris. Thanks Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to uh, now welcome Sean Whitaker to the stage uh, from Holding Redlich. Um, and Sean is going to be talking to us about capital constraints and how we fund the new not, era. Not, not quite. Not quite. Change of program. There we go. Not quite. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, CHPs as BTR operators. So um, not quite sure where that one came from, but I tried to correct it when, uh, when I sent through the brief. But uh, this is probably a subject that all you're all pretty interested in around... You just heard it from Luke and Chris, obviously, about the, you know, the market in BTR um, and the opportunities available there. Now, at, you know, for you guys as CHPs, a lot of CHPs in the room, it's about you know, what are the opportunities, but also what are the risks that you take on being a BTR operator of uh, community housing assets. So question one, can CHPs be effective, affordable and private BTR operators? The answer is yes. <laughs> so it's pretty easy. Uh, but as all lawyers say, should you do it? Uh, there's a big but there afterwards. So it's not as simple as just rolling in and doing it. Let's weigh it up in 15 minutes or less, I guess, uh, to try and do this quickly, because I know some of the room have been standing for quite some time, so I'll, I'll try and do it quickly. Um, so looking at the questions, you know, what BTR projects are suitable for CHP? So this is your first you know, core so the question you've got to ask yourself is what type of BTR projects do I want to be involved in as an organisation? Um, it's nice to go after the straight resi BTR, but let's be honest, none of you in the room are really going to be doing that. So it's a pretty simple question in the sense of where I've outlined in blue, you're talking about social and affordable projects, something with an element of social, um, you know, that aligns with obviously all your missions and purposes, but something with a bit of social outcome, afford, you know, uh, social and affordable housing, social and affordable housing with a private component or an SDA component included, and then also affordable and private housing projects where you've got things that at or below market rent. So we're not really talking about market rent and above and trying to pull off, you know, the 25% potential premiums and things like that around different areas. For CHPs, this is the niche market that you really would be looking to target um, in terms of how that aligns with your values, but also as a not-for-profit, you can still make money at that level compared to private operators who need to, who you know, have slightly different models to you guys. Um, the reason this is also important is because of what the government wants. So the government, as you've seen recently with the PHRP ground lease model, and there's a session on that, I think earlier today or tomorrow, um, New South Wales lack ground lease transaction, you've got a combination of social and private, um, Queensland HIF Fund, talking to them, we're putting in projects which you've got social, affordable and private all linked in together. And then you've got also the Tasmanian Housing Redevelopment Program, which is social and affordable as well. So you can see around the country, this is what's coming out. We don't want to give you guys just social housing, big housing build accepted. I know that's what that is for any Homes Victoria people in the room, so I haven't ignored that. But it is... Um, a good model because you are diversifying the revenue stream, you are sort of slightly targeting different cohorts, particularly with the affordable component where social housing tenants down on CRA don't make as much sense as, you know, maybe key worker housing or affordable housing tenants that can play closer to that 70 to 75% of market rent. You've also got tax implications and benefits that come with being at and or below 75% of market rent. Uh, and then the private component to that, um, and we'll talk to this in a second, but you'll notice you've sort of got a streamed, or sort of like a, a, a pathway here from social to affordable to private in these projects, and that is a key policy focus of the governments at the moment, is let's not just build more social housing in clusters, let's build social housing and affordable housing and private housing to help people get through that tenant pathway as well. So... That's nice, we can get our tenants um, and we know what type of projects we want to do, so what are the benefits to you of going out and taking on that role? Well, the benefits are it's not that big a leap. As we've already discussed and, and people have said already, BTR is your game. This is what you do. Um, and you deliver services to tenants, you do asset management, um, you own and or manage properties on behalf of the government. Um, this is not a big stretch for you to then move into operational phases of affordable private, excluding, as we're talking about there, the concierge models, the, 
the models where tenant demand is quite high because you're paying a premium and people expect a higher level of service. But let's just take it back to the last slide where I was talking about what type of projects you're in. Um, you've got, yeah, so it's not a big stretch. You have strong background and community engagement and access. So that's, that's about the models. So a lot of uh, BTR operators, uh, and, and, you know, and there's been some very successful ones, but they have a brand and you go to live in their buildings. And this is an area that you know, CHPs don't necessarily um, promote themselves on and or try to you know, look at as a diversified income stream, but what is it about a CHP as a brand? Do I want to live in your type, of, you know, your type of apartment, your type of unit, your type of um, building at, at, a, at a greater length? What services do you guys provide? Because you do provide them, you just don't promote them as well as those brands that talk about you know, this is what we do and this is how we connect people. And so there's, a, there's an upskilling element here um, around CHPs taking on that, you know, community engagement role and really making it into a sort of a, you know, a, a standout point. And then you typically already have asset management teams in place. So you're already looking after buildings across, you know, some of you across nationally, some of you across, you know, all the, you know, the states that you operate in. Um, you have relationships with asset managers. Um, so you know how to get that done as well. The other piece of benefiting is it's an alternative income stream. So liquidity is an issue for CHPs. The models where we are, I've got a bunch of houses and I'm gonna leverage them up to borrow money from NIFIC or I'm gonna leverage them up to borrow money from, you know, low cost loans or wherever, is on the decline. That's happened already. So now it's about what else can I do to grow my portfolio? How do I grow my portfolio? Where do I borrow that money from? And ultimately, the, the response you're going to hear back from everybody, it's cash flow. You need to have the cash flow. We need to see the cash flow to make sure this works. It's not enough to have just properties over here and properties over there because we're sort of out of the leverage model to some degree. We can only borrow so much against static assets. What, you, what CHPs need to be looking for is diversified cash flow streams. This is one of them promoting, and it's a simple one because you already do it, but promoting your sort of, you know, a cash flow stream for management services, for tenancy management services, asset management services, things like that, that you can make more money in a single building than you do across 50 odd properties, single house dwellings across the suburbs of New South Wales or, you know, suburbs of uh, Melbourne. The one at the bottom is slightly controversial, but this is where we're talking about in the traditional BTR operator model, you've got a BTR operator that charges a fee, and that fee is often a percentage of revenues potentially in some of the models. It also might be just, um, it's also cost recovery plus a fee. So you get all your money back, you spend on OPEX and asset management in your budget, plus a fee depending on the rentals that come in. The vacancy underwriting model is slightly different. This is, I will pay the owner a fixed amount, almost like a lease, and I will take everything else underneath. So if this asset outperforms our, our um, forecast, I see the upside as a CHP. I collect the rents from my tenants, they're my people, and I get the benefit if I'm successful at what I do. Now that is not something that's widely used, um, but it is a model worth considering because as again, when you're talking about social and affordable, we know where the tenants are. It's not a much of a risk of the market having to look for people who are willing to pay market rent or above. You kind of filling social and affordable housing is not that big a, big a problem. <laughs> so, so you can look at these models and decide which one sort of works for you. Um, but you know, there's a few varieties out there of things and these help with your cash flow. So they help with that income stream that we're talking about. And it's sort of talking about you know, two ways, one, um, can I use this on my existing buildings um, that I already have? And two, can I participate in these new projects as a fully fledged operator willing to take you know, the risk for, um, for the institutional investment? The other benefit is obviously the government focus I talked about, which is mixed housing is here to stay. We're not gonna see huge blocks of social housing going up anymore. Everything has a component of social, affordable, private. You might have healthcare, ancillary services. I think the lady up the back was talking about mental health services and then also talking about you know, disability services and things like that. There's a, it's all starting to get blended and precincts in particular, which leads to the second point, inclusionary planning. You're not seeing precincts going up around the country without this being a, you know, a part of it. 
So what can we do with the residential components of all the new government infrastructure projects that we're building around the country? Well, we want a component of social housing, we want a component of affordable housing, we want a component of SDA, potentially. Um, so the bigger projects, the bigger investments, the bigger growth opportunities for CHPs are all sitting in this space. So you need to get used to um, that sort of, we're going to have to get used to that sort of role if you want to participate in that, in that space. And then the last point I touched on was about tenant pathways, which is, you know, the social to affordable to private or social to private or, you know, whatever. And, 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 and some of you have shared equity, you know, opportunities and some have um, co-living opportunities as well. These are, this model creates pathways for tenants, which I know you all care about deeply and is a core focus of your service is dealing with social housing tenants. But then what do they do after they leave social housing as well? However, Sounds great on paper, just waltz on in, um, get yourself, you know, a thousand apartments to look after and, and let's make a whole bunch of money. Um, not so simple um, in the sense that, and this is often a board uh, level discussion, this is where we, we often meet a lot of conflict with, um, with boards, is these challenges. So these are huge projects. These are not these are not your 20 dwellings in Moorabbin and then another 10 in Brunswick and then another five in Parramatta and another six in whatever. Some of these are over a thousand dwellings. Some of, most of them are at least 200. Now it fits the BTR model because there's scale and that's what we need. We need scale, but it's a lot to take on. And if you guys are not ready um, and you don't have the organizational capacity to, to look after 200, 300, 400, 500 going up, in one location, this can become a big challenge. So we need to talk about um, you know, the size of the projects and what you guys need to invest as organisations into taking on these roles. Scalability is also a fundamental requirement. You don't want to do this on one particular site and employ all these people and then have nothing else. So you want to partner up with some people um, to sort of look at the developers and, and other people who are doing these models to work out where are my opportunities in different locations to really make this a, a worthwhile investment from an organisation perspective, taking on the people for asset management, taking on the people for tenancy management. Um, that sort of covers the third point as well. You've got to invest in personnel. Most of the BTR platforms that operate at a, at a high level have got very sophisticated technology platforms. That is not necessarily the case in CHP world. And that's a level of investment that the organisation has to look at taking on. You are, you know, these days the rental market um, and technology sort of go hand in hand. You would have seen, if anyone is renting, you know, payments are going through electronic platforms, asset management's going through electronic platforms. This is sort of, you know, the level you need to invest in to sort of get up to speed to take on these kind of roles. The other one, the fourth one's slightly problematic we've seen in past is CHPs in terms of funds and reporting. So sometimes CHPs are seen as one big pile of money coming in and one big pile of money going out for various things. If you work in project finance, if you work on various projects, if you work as a BTR operator, particularly if you don't own the building, um, you've got reporting requirements to the owners, you need to segregate that cash, you may have lenders involved that, that require us to segregate the cash, it needs to go to the right places. So again, there's investment in treasury, treasury capability, investment in um, finance managers and things like that to make sure you're on top of you know, your compliance aspects of this role. And the last one's real estate licensing issues. A lot of people don't realise this, but you do need a licence to rent things out, um, even if it's on behalf of somebody else. So um, I know most of you have it, but not in every state. So it's, it's, it can be quite a tricky uh, one. We've seen people come, un, come unstuck because they didn't have... Uh, didn't actually, couldn't actually enter into a lease with any of the tenants and, and have, have um, had to get sub-licensed down to somebody else to do this for them. So um, it's not great, but um, it is a, a relevant issue to look after. So employ someone with a real estate agent's licence if you can. Then we talk about asset management. So assuming I've got my you know, scalability under control, um, the underwriting for fee for service model is what I've just talked about before, but that single building exposure versus a spread of risk, like you don't want to have all your problems, not your problems, but you don't want to have all your, you know, all your chips in one building basket because if something goes wrong with that building, the whole, you don't have anywhere else to go in terms of revenue streams and diversifying your income because you've lost it all in one building. 
So it's a good idea, like I said, to build those partnerships, um, you know, and try and, if you are going to take on the BTR operator role, you know, try and do it across a number of locations, not just one particular location where you, where you are affected and effectively take a portfolio approach to a lot of things, which leads to the next point around KPIs. You can take KPIs, um, will be pushed down to you as an asset manager and as a BTR operator. Um, these BTR KPIs are pretty fluid at the moment. Um, the ones that are, uh, you know, come out of government projects have been quite have been quite loose and, and, and pretty fair, um, but you're not going to get that in institutional capital deals where it's, and particularly where banks are involved, where they're going to like really nail down on making sure that revenue is there. Because if you're sitting at, and again, this is alleviated by being social and affordable to a large extent, but if you're sitting at 70% occupancy, 60% occupancy, you're in a world of trouble with those KPIs. And the question is, who pays? Is it your fault as the operator for not procuring enough tenants? Or is it just, this is a bad building? And then does the equity share the risk? Does the capital share the risk? And this is the fight that we can constantly have around, um, you know, not whose fault is it, but who's going to wear the risk? You know, are you effectively underwriting the rents? Because if you don't, you're going to lose your, your operational role and you pl plunge a whole bunch of money into this asset to, um, to be the operator. And people don't want to lose that role because it's, you know, it's an important part of, you know, what they're doing. So those asset management KPIs often relate to vacancy. They relate to responsiveness on capital assets. So, you know, you're talking things like 48-hour turnaround or less on repairs and maintenance. Um, making sure scheduled capital expenditure is done within a certain time frame. Um, marketing and vacancy management to a certain, you know, in accordance with, you know, um, the requirements of the building owner or the government. And then also, um, but, but look, obviously the main one is obviously vacancy, making sure that you have people in the building paying rent. And this is where the risk lies. So, you know, fee for service model, obviously that risk tends to sit with equity, but you are going to get booted if you're not good at putting in tenants. And in an underwriting model, well, it's you. So you're going to wear the risk. So either there are, it's like take or pay. You're, you're either are the people there or you're going to pay for it either way. So that's a key aspect to get around this is what are your asset management KPIs and can we, can we do them? Um, and then a pro last one's profitable asset management model. Some, historically in the CHP sector, some, sometimes there's been a bit of a tendency to go towards cost recovery. So as long as my costs are covered and I'm a not-for-profit, that's okay. So if I get my money back, plus a little bit for the staff, the FTV, you know, I've got to employ, that's okay. Um, and that's led to some, you know, can lead to some services contracts or particularly in these roles where you, you're not charging as much as a private operator would charge. Um, you're not charging as much as the market will pay effectively. And so this is where CHPs need to get, a little, you know, grow a little bit more around, around this time space. I'm, I'm literally done after this slide. So. Uh, forget about tenants. No, um, <laughs> just uh, just in terms of rights of tenants, just as a legal point, the RTA rights. So when you sign up to people, and this is where the BTA world's going, if you sign up to people to long-term leases, two, three years, but then you're not happy with them, it's a world of pain to get them out. So just bear that in mind. It sounds great about long-term tenancy, but if they're not great, it can be difficult. Um, and the last point's a really critical one around affordable housing. You've all seen 75% of market rent or below, but where do you get these tenants and what rent do you charge them? Do you all charge 75% of market rent and that's it? Or do we take some people who pot potentially can't afford to pay that and a bit lower? And that's a battle within CHPs around mission and purpose. We should be taking these people because they need it. But actually the financials say I need to charge this. And so how do I, how do I you know, balance the two? So key takeaways, projects with social housing elements, obviously the best opportunities for you guys as BTR operators um, into the future. Make sure your strategy has scalability and organisation resources up appropriately. You know, partnerships are a great way to start. Don't just bundle out there on your own. But if we can, you know, build build those great partnerships with developers and, and, and operators already. That, that be, that's that's a good idea. And then get market advice around what you should be charging. I can't stress that enough because everything looks great in the models and the forecasts, but the data's not there yet to show how this is all going to play out. So make sure you get some sound advice around around that from me or EY or <laughs> everyone else who operates in the, in the market. Um, so, yeah, and that's it.
Perfect. Thanks, Sean. Some really great insights around, I guess, the uh, the benefits and challenges of uh, pursuing BTRs. Now we're going to open up the floor to questions for Sean. Do we have any questions? Well, that's great. I'll just answer them all. Jeez. You must have answered all their questions. It was such a great presentation. Oh, no, one over here. Got a friendly. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's the kind of thing. I mean, um, there are some models, like Chris's model, where you have a, you know, a partnership, and that's a solid way to go to start out, um, to work out, how, you know, how, to, if you want to do it at scale. Um, there are some people who just go in hell for leather and straight into the, to the social, affordable and private, and I'll take, I'll take the whole lot. Um, and, you know, that comes from a background of, you know, understanding that I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to over-service. I'm not trying to charge people more than, than they would get in a normal market. And can I, can I be any worse than a real estate agency and an investment property manager? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's that level. Um, now, that ignores all the community benefits that you're trying to build in your building, but that's kind of the approach is, you know, I, I can do this because it's not, you know, Ray White does this and it's not that art, you know. So, um, to be perfect, I mean, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of where it's at. But it, like I said, it ignores all the stuff around you know, getting people into the building and making them want to stay at that building and, and building that connection with your brand and your building and, and that's a that's a that's the balancing part, you know, um, around it. So there's there's both, basically to answer your question. Um, the more operators you have, the more cooks in the kitchen. So that's, that's just how it is. Okay, do we have any questions? Any further questions? Okay. Well, again, what a great way to kick off our, uh, our think tank session. And I'd like to thank all of our presenters, Luke, Chris, Sean. What a fantastic, uh, fantastic group of presentations um, and really gives us some great insights into the build to rent and rent to buy models. Um, so with that, uh, you're free to go and I hope to see you this afternoon for this afternoon session. <laughs>